right, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Chesapeake Bay Program Year 3 webinar. My name is Rachel Sabitsky. I'm a geospatial program manager at the Chesapeake Conservancy. I'm joined by my colleagues today, David Saavedra, Louis Cadell, Katie Walker, and Jake Lazier, who are all leads on other objectives of the Chesapeake Bay Program uh, Cooperative Agreement, and they will all be presenting today. Um, so I'm just going to get started with some um, some brief introductions to the presentation today as people still log on. So we did this last year as well, but we have audience polling throughout the presentation. Um, and we asked folks to just sign on either on their phones or on their browser to this website, www.menti.com. And if you enter this code here, 4262, 6120. It should allow you to see the questions as I pull them up throughout the presentation. This allows it to be a more interactive uh, webinar today. And as I pull up the questions, this code will be at the bottom of the page, the PowerPoint slide as well. So you'll always have that in front of you. Um, people are still joining, but I'm just going to go ahead and start with our first introduction question. This is to test Menti and see if everything's working, just to get a sense of what type of organizations are represented here today. If you're a nonprofit, local government, state government, federal, private, community member, or other. So I'm going to switch over to the screen, and it allows us to see as people answer, it kind of comes live on the screen, which is really fun. So I'll give this a 30 seconds for people to, to put in their responses. We've got lots of state and local government, a little bit of everybody here today. And this will allow you to continue uh, to respond even after I pull it off the screen. And for those that are just joining, um, you can just go to this website at the bottom of the PowerPoint slides when the questions pop up and you can enter the code and answer along with us. So the next question is, what geography do you currently focus your work on? So this can be watershed or state or county, local, anything like that. So when I click through here, so now as you guys answer these questions, it should uh, show up on the screen as well. And the, um, the website is it's www.menti.com and the code is also on the top of this page here. Thank you, Katie, for sending that. So just trying to see who's uh, signed on today from which jurisdictions. And... and this will again, this question will remain on the screen until we get to a our next question. So when people join, they can log on and, and answer the questions. Looks like we got a lot of different folks here, so it's awesome. All right, I'm going to switch back to the presentation now, and then um, we can pull this up again as we go through. All right, so again, this is uh, our webinar on the Chesapeake Bay Program Cooperative Agreement. It's a six-year cooperative agreement um, with four different objectives, and each objective will be presenting today on updates to their projects throughout the last year. It's our third annual webinar. We do this at the end of every uh, year um, just to give everybody an update on what's going on for the, you know, what they can expect in the years to come and what happened last year. Um, so objective one is the land cover and land use project when we're working with the University of Vermont spatial analysis lab on that project. And I will be presenting first on that. Objective two is our hydrography uh, project and we're working with UMBC, Department of Geography and Environmental Systems. Objective three is our BMP mapping and field doc update project and they're working with Chesapeake Commons and Drexel Academy of Natural Sciences. Objective four, we're just working mostly with Chesapeake Bay program themselves on that. And that is um, just general geospatial support. So the first presentation will be on objective one. Um, so again, my name is Rachel Sabitsky. For folks who are just joining, um, I am managing the land cover land use and change project. 
Um, again, we're partnering with UVM on this project, and the main goal is to create those three data sets for the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed for 2017 and 18, which is what we've just wrapped up for the most part, um, and then 2021 and 2022 as well. So just a little bit of background for folks who maybe haven't seen one of our webinars before. Um, back in 2016, we published a 2013 and 14 high resolution one meter land to cover and land use data set for the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed um, and the intersecting counties. So it covers 100,000 square miles. Um, so this project was to create a 2017 and 18 uh, product and create change maps between the two time periods. So on the left is our 2017-18 uh, land cover product, and the middle is the land use product. Um, and on the right, you can see a, an example of what the change products look like. So we are creating a change product for both the land cover and the land use, and these have different classes, and I'll get into details on what those classes look like in a few more slides. Um, you can see the change product um, where there is no change on the landscape, there is no data, there's only data where there is change. Um, so it's a little different than what we're used to with these wall-to-wall -wall land cover, land use classifications. So just a summary of the past year. Um, we, I, I sent out an email to my uh, lister of a few, I don't know, six or eight months ago maybe about the versioning system and the timeline change. Um, so what we've done is uh, we have a version one of the land cover, the land cover change, the land use product and the land use change product that was delivered to Chesapeake Bay program in June. Um, this version one product we're calling preliminary because there was some quality control performed on the data sets. However, we wanted to have more time to fully incorporate the local feedback that we've been collecting um, and just a more thorough quality control on the data before we publish it for everyone to download and be able to use. That final product will be called version two. That's what I've been calling it. Um, and that is the one that will be publicly released in February. And we'll talk more about that data release in a few slides. Um, throughout the last year, we've and before that, we've worked really closely with Chesapeake Bay program work groups, like especially the land use work group, other work groups like the forestry work group and the ag work group and the water quality get. Um, so just really to have people review the data, review the class definitions and the rules to create different land use classes specifically um, to incorporate local feedback. Um, on the right here is the map of where our local outreach for input to the land cover product was um, kind of performed and you know what's remaining uh, to be reviewed still. Um, basically, I performed outreach to the counties to try to get feedback on the land cover. People could put points on the map to tell us what they found errors, um, and that would help with the QAQC. Um, just allows for local input from people that know the landscape the best. You can see there are a few that are still in review, and that's okay because we have a few months before, you know, while we're UVM is helping to incorporate these edits, um, going state by state, so we still have time to incorporate more feedback from a certain jurisdictions there. Another really cool accomplishment this past year was solar field mapping. Um, so we did this uh, in partnership with Defenders of Wildlife and our data scientists on our team. We found a need um, to map solar fields in a polygon format because we only had some point data sets that weren't always accurate and we wanted to incorporate um, a solar field class and the land use product. Um, so we work again, we work with Defenders of Wildlife on an AI model. I won't get into all those detailed technical details here, but basically the end result is a 2020 output for our solar fields. This is QAQC, the quality control by Washington College's GIS lab to match with our time period of NAEP for the land use classification, um, the solar fields class. You can see on the right, this is the point data set of where, you know, zoomed out where they all, you know, are located across the Bay watershed. And keep in mind, this is solar fields. We were not interested in mapping um, solar on buildings. So while sometimes the output actually did accidentally capture those, we would correct that for our um, final data set. So um, you can, there's a link, it's pretty long, but if you wanted to just see the web application to show you these examples, or I actually put the link here which I can put in the chat later um, or email out with the um, recording, but is, you can download this data set. You can download the raw AI output, which is not corrected yet, this 2020 time period. 
You could also download our corrected output for 2020, and you can download the 2017 and 18 output, which matches our land use and land cover product, or just the land use product. So all that's published for people to download, and it's polygons and it's set of points. So that was something that was pretty cool that came out of this past year. Um, and just to review uh, the land use classes, this, they, they are actually different than the previous land use class from 2013 and 14, um, and even a little bit different than the webinar we did last year. They were, you know, as we developed them, they changed a little bit or just, you know, the, where they fell within the categorization. Um, so I'll just go over this real quick. Um, there is the water category, which um, gets classified a little bit further into lentic water bodies, such as estuaries, lakes, and ponds, the streams and rivers, uh, and anything else is just in the classic water class there. Um, for wetlands and water margins, we have tidal wetlands, riverine, non-tidal. We have terrene, isolated, non-tidal wetlands, and then a bare shore class. For forest, we have you know, our forest class, which is anything greater or equal to one acre and 240 foot width. Then we have other tree canopy categories. So this is something that's not forest and it doesn't fall into our developed tree canopy classes. Um, so that is kind of our other tree canopy class. And then we have a harvested forest class, which includes timber harvest areas, and then a natural succession class, um, which, you know, it kind of, they all roll up into forest category, but the natural succession is usually more scrub shrub areas that are being let, you know, grow back to their natural state. We also have our production category, which includes agriculture classes such as cropland, pasture and hay, and orchard and vineyard. We have an extractive, so an active mines category as well, um, which we, you know, hand digitize that data set with the help of Washington College, um, and then incorporate that into the land use. Uh, we also have that solar fields class, as I mentioned above or before. Um, we have an impervious solar and pervious solar, depending on what the land cover type is within the land use. And then finally, we have our developed uh, category here, which has impervious. So these are the roads, structures, and other impervious that comes from the land cover, including the tree canopy over all impervious classes. And we have pervious developed, which is turf grass, bare developed, suspended succession. Um, and tree canopy over turf grass. So again, these are a little bit different than 2013's data set. And with these updates, we are planning to reclassify the 2013 and 14 data set to match these classes. So we'll all speak to each other and match. I'm just gonna go over what these data sets look like in more detail. So this is, you know, 2017, 18 NAEP imagery. And this is the land cover product. Um, you can see, you know, it has those tree canopy over impervious surfaces, classes, it has a few impervious classes, um, and most of this on this landscape is herbaceous or low vegetation in that light green, um, shrubland, water, wetlands, and so forth. Um, so the main difference between the land cover and the land use is you can see, as I flip through here, all of that light green that falls into herbaceous is actually now classified as what the land is being used for. So as you can see here, there's a lot of agriculture there. There's some turf grass, um, pasture, a lot more is happening than just this light green vegetation state here. So the land use really uh, deciphers that further. And we have all of these classes on the right and not even all of them are shown on the screen right now because there is a ton of them. Um, but we have harvested forest showed there in red. We have cropland, pasture, turf grass, suspended succession are all shown on the screen here, natural succession, things like that. And this also breaks up our forest category, as I mentioned, into you know other tree canopy, uh, tree canopy over turf grass and things like that. And we, you know, the land cover is a big input to make this land use data set. That's why they, they match pretty closely, except for some of the classes they get more broken out into more detail, but the land cover, local ancillary data sets like uh, local land use, um, statewide data sets, all of these data sets, the parcel data sets were all used to create the land use product. So to go into the examples of change, um, again, on the left, there's the 2013 and 14 NAEP imagery, which is a little hard to see. Um, and then the 2017, 18 NAEP, and you can see there is um, an 
the first time period looks like there was a neighborhood being started to be constructed, but not all of it. Some of the buildings were already there. Um, and then you can see in the uh, land cover product um, on the right there that basically all the buildings were, the new buildings were captured correctly. Um, it did capture a lot of this barren land that goes into uh, turf grass as barren to herbaceous in the land cover. So that's good. However, all of this, um, these buildings to the top right, the land cover captures that there's new buildings, but it doesn't capture that this one from an agriculture field to turf grass it, because in the land cover, that's all herbaceous land. Um, so when we click to the land use, the difference here now you can see around those buildings, there is change that is pulled out. We are able to identify that this was agriculture before and now it is turf grass. So the land is being used differently now. And all areas that were, we didn't identify change at has no data, as I mentioned before. So it's a pretty cool data set. Um, but all of these will be available publicly once, well, I'll get into the timeline of that, but anyway, <laughs> that will be available soon. So here's the schedule of, for product delivery. Um, so the big timeline to look forward to is February, end of February of 2022. Um, again, what I'm calling the version two or the final products of the 2017-18 land cover, the 2013-14 correction. So while UVM makes the change data set, they identify where there are mistakes in 2013 and 14 and they correct those mistakes. So it's an updated version. And then this change product of the land cover change, along with the land use classification for 2017-18, the reclassification, like I said, the different classes reclass into our classes, uh, for 2013 and 14, and then the change product. So all of that will be available to download for free by anybody. Um, it'll be on our website. I will send out a link to the listserv or notification with where to download the data sets um, and when they are available. Um, so email me if you're not on the listserv, if you are invited to the webinar some other way than my email, um, please email me and I can add you to that. They will be in raster format and be available by geography. So like it is right now on our website, you can currently download the 2013-14 data sets. It's available by county, statewide, and then baywide. So that's our plan moving forward for the new data sets as well. All right, so now back to the question for the audience. For people that are new, you can go to the website at the bottom of my screen and type in that code. Um, I'm just curious, to hear how many people plan to use the new data set, um, either the land cover, land use, change, and if so, which products. So here. Now everybody should be allowed to uh, put in their answers. Oh, and I'm looking at the chat now, it looks like. Thank you, Susan, to, for answering some of these questions and posting that link. And I, you know, I wish I could turn off that. When people enter and exit the webinar, I was trying to figure out how to turn off that noise that comes up, but I could not figure that out. All right. So it looks like a lot of people like the land cover data set and the land use data set pretty close behind. Um, you know, the change products are new products, so it's exciting to see that people want planning to use it. Um, we've never had such detailed change products before that I'm aware of, at least at this scale. So I think we're all excited to use that and see what we can do with it. I'll just give it a few more seconds. I see some people are still responding. I'm glad that nobody doesn't plan to use them. That's good to know. <laughs> or maybe they're not answering. All right, I'm gonna put to the next question. It just gets into a little bit more detail. I'm curious if people plan to use it and they know what they're gonna use it for. Um, you guys could put a quick snippet of what your plan is. Um, we like to collect use cases to you know, show the Bay program and others that these data sets are useful and that we should keep making them. Um, I didn't go into this much today, but we do plan to on um, the next process in the next three years will be to create the 2021 and 22 time period and the change product as well. Um, so that is the current plan of action. And I 
appreciate everybody responding to these. That's a comprehensive plan update. Awesome. exciting to see how everyone's planning to use the data. We've worked hard for the last three years on it and it's, we just want people to be able to do some awesome work with all of this stuff, which is great. Um, again, this slide will stay on the screen as I pass the presentation over to David. Um, we will, you can continue to fill this in and then once his question comes up, then I believe you can't answer this one anymore. So I'm going to pass it to, oh, actually, are there any questions that I didn't not answer or that were not answered in the chat already. Here's my email again for anybody that didn't have it yet. You can either ask this, ask your questions now via the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask me now. We'll also have time at the very end if you think of something. All right, I guess I will pass it over to, oh, sorry, I see that there was a question in the chat um the time frame for the delivery so i'll go back a few slides so this is a february 2022 timeline for delivery of the final fully qatc data set so if you have any internal needs you know before that email me we can talk and kind of see if there's a possibility for us to share preliminary data um, it really depends on what the use case is for the other data sets we're trying not to share too much because they're not final yet but we understand people's project timelines are sometimes sooner than February. All right. Any other questions, you can uh, message me in the chat or ask at the end. All right. David, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Rachel. And I will still uh, control the Okay. So I am David Saavedra. I'm leading the hydrography effort for the Bay Program Cooperative Agreement. Um, this is a project that we're working on in conjunction with Dr. Matthew Baker at UMBC. Um, so Nick, could you go to the next slide, please? So a really quick overview. Um, I know that the land cover probably gets most of the attention of these four objectives, but just in case you didn't remember what the hydrography is all about, um, this is an effort to produce detailed uh, hyper-resolution hydrography, is what we're calling it, uh, for the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So these data are, are produced using LIDAR DEMs and a novel approach that we've developed with BC in 2017, um, before we were awarded this cooperative agreement. So rather than relying on um, traditional approaches like flow accumulation and thresholding different measures of curvature um, and producing these regional thresholds, which can fail in different regions. Uh, we've developed an approach that relies on the detail that is inherently within the LIDAR elevation data and uses uh, line of sight algorithms to actually directly detect where these channels exist in the landscape um, and map them as they are visible in the DEM. And you can see a really good example of that on the screen here. So we didn't need to threshold this stream to tell it to originate at any given point. Um, it is just mapped exactly where it's shown in the DEM. And as part of this project, we are continuing to improve and refine the development of this data. Um, and we are updating it as needed as we make these refinements and get new LIDAR and so on. Um, next slide, please. So to go over the process that we use for this data, um, I've sort of I have a tracking progress map that I'll show on the next slide. Um, and if you'd seen it before, there were like just three steps on it, which we realized wasn't actually reflective of the work that goes into producing this data and kind of left viewers in the dark about what's happening. Um, so I've updated that and made this color-coded workflow. 
that better reflects what we're doing. Um, and there's actually a lot that goes into it. So I won't go into great detail about all of these items, but in general, there are seven steps and each step has several sub steps to it. Um, but the ones that I wanna call attention to are step three, the automated channel extraction. So this is sort of the initial data production step. Um, steps one and two are sort of just acquiring and preparing the elevation data. But at step three, we take that elevation data and we produce initial channel skeletons from it. So these are two-dimensional raster channels. So they map these stream channels and other channels from bank to bank. Um, they inherently have width aspect to them. And these channels can be discontinuous, whether they are real discontinuities, uh, like channels just washing out and then reforming later down the slope, or in karst topography, if the channel goes underground and it's no longer visible in the LIDAR, um, we would map that discontinuity. And they can also be, um, I guess, artificial discontinuities. And when I say that, I mean, like if a road goes over the stream, um, you no longer see the channel from the elevation model because the road is on top of it. So that kind of discontinuity would also be reflected. And lastly, uh, this initial channel skeleton doesn't distinguish um, streams from all non-stream features. So we have several sort of filters or controls in place to minimize the amount of non-stream features we map in the first place. But despite that, there are still some non-stream features that look very much like streams and they occur in similar places that streams occur. Um, and so those are included in this data set and they are not distinguished from the streams until step four and the bottom left here, random forest classification. So we take that initial um, channel skeleton and we use a machine learning model called random forest. And using that and some other data, uh, we classify that 2D raster stream skeleton into stream features and non-stream features. So we've noticed seven different types of non-stream features that we're including thus far. Um, and this random forest model will produce a probabilistic estimate for any given feature. Um, the probability that it's a stream or one of these other different types of features. And then steps five and six are sort of iterative. Um, it's not necessarily step five, then step six, but what we'll do is make a one dimensional continuous polyline network from the features that are classified as streams. And this polyline will sort of connect the dots across those discontinuities. And it allows us to add attributes and we can even manipulate the vector if we need to. Um, and then we're gonna manually interpret the results of that and if we see any sort of systematic problems or errors that need to be corrected, um, we can do that and then reproduce the polyline network and um, just kind of refine the, the final data set there. And then step seven attribution, we can add reach scale summaries of different channel characteristics like width, uh, bank height, stream order, and some others we haven't decided on a final list yet. Um, that's something we're talking with the Bay program about and our advisory committee. Um, next slide, please. So like I mentioned, I'm tracking this progress on a map here. Um, the link is on the screen. Maybe somebody can put that in the chat. I'm not sure. It's the same link that Rachel has been using for the land cover tracking. Um, it's just a different layer in that map. So you can see on the map that the majority of the watershed is in this pink color. So we've completed the automated channel extraction for nearly the entire watershed. Um, we've produced polylines for a few Huck 8s uh, in the um, Lancaster region of Pennsylvania and around Baltimore. And there are a few watersheds you'll see that aren't colored in. 
So these are ones where we don't have complete LIDAR coverage. So we have not um, moved forward with processing. And the ones in Virginia, we are expecting new LIDAR to be delivered um, in the following weeks. Um, we've been told by USGS that that data set is complete and they're in the process of mailing out hard drives to different recipients. So we've been um, put on the priority list to, to receive that data so we can move forward with this. And then the other watersheds around the periphery of New York and Western uh, Pennsylvania, they're mostly covered by LIDAR. Um, what we will end up doing is just processing the sub watersheds within these watersheds that have LIDAR. Um, and I, I plan to update this map at a finer watershed scale so that you can see within these watersheds where the sub watersheds have LIDAR. So um, this will look a little different in the coming weeks and it will look less incomplete. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, um, we do a channel classification procedure with random forest model on all of our uh, stream features and non-stream features. So to do this, we take those channel features and we summarize different terrain characteristics like um, slope and curvature. And we look at the actual shape of the features. Are they straight and linear or are they very sinuous? Um, we look at the land cover composition surrounding them. So are these features surrounded by forest or are they surrounded by low vegetation or agriculture? Um, and a few other uh, characteristics. We summarize these for each channel feature and use that as input to the random forest model. And like I mentioned, it outputs probability of a feature being a stream or something else. And you can see examples of that on the right here. Um, these are graphical representations of each of the different categories and their probability of being a stream. So on the bottom, you can see all these non-stream features like floodplains and detention basins and uh, ditches and gullies, they all have low probabilities of being a stream. Um, and then on the top graph, you can see two different uh, plots that are both skewed heavily to the left and to the right. So the one that's skewed heavily to the right is the probability of all of our stream features that we manually interpreted as streams. Um, this is their probability according to the model that they are streams. So they are um, very, there's a little, little confusion in this graph is what I'm trying to say. Um, the streams that we said were streams, the model agrees are streams. And then at the bottom is the probability of the features that we interpreted as non-streams. They have a low probability of being streams and there's little overlap. Uh, it's just in this sort of middle region between maybe 40 to 60% where these features might get confused. So like I mentioned, we'll take the stream features from the classification to produce blue line maps. Um, these are those connected polyline maps. Um, the, they'll be a little more familiar, um, like what most people would expect when they get a stream map. Um, and importantly, we are retaining all of the non-stream features. So just because it's a ditch or a gully, um, doesn't mean we're going to throw it out because those features are useful for a number of different purposes. And uh, we want to retain that. But we, at the same time, we recognize that those are features that not everyone needs to, to work with all the time. So sometimes people need just a street map and other times they're interested in those other types of features. So we plan to have, um, a data set where you can sort of toggle which types of features you want to use at any time. Next slide, please. So to go into some detail on the non-stream features that I've mentioned, um, these are ones that we've encountered frequently in the uh, lower Susquehanna and the Patapsco region um, around Lancaster County and Baltimore. So these are subject to change. Um, 
obviously we may encounter different types of features as we work throughout the Chesapeake Bay. But thus far we've encountered rills and gullies. So these are short, usually straight, um, erosive features, frequently surrounded by low vegetation in the land cover. Um, so they occur in like fields and, and such. Sometimes they're surrounded by tree canopy. Um, we have agricultural ditches. These are typically long and linear. Um, they're uniform in shape and the bank angles are usually uniform. They're almost always surrounded by low vegetation in the land cover. Um, similarly, we have roadside ditches, which are again, long and linear, very uniform, and they occur near roads in the land cover. We also identify floodplain features. So these are things like ox oxbows, backwaters, uh, secondary remnant channels, meander scars. So these all look like channels. Um, they probably were stream channels at some point, but they're disconnected from the mainstream now, but they are on the floodplain. And due to that, they get identified by our process, but they um, are not necessarily streams now, but they're of interest. We also map detention features. Um, so these are things like ponds and swales, um, detention basins, meant to store runoff. Usually we find these either in agricultural or developed areas. We find headwater wetlands. These are small, round or irregular shaped wetlands near stream heads. Um, this is a pretty infrequent class, but we've noticed it enough to make a category out of it. And then other, um, sometimes these features, we can't identify what they are or they just don't appear to be fluvial at all. Um, they're just depressions in the landscape for whatever reason, and they occur near the streams and look sort of like channels, so they get mapped occasionally. Next slide. This is a visual example of um, what I was describing about how the different steps distinguish features differently. So in the upper left, you see just um, some imagery of a stream and a farm. In the upper right is an example of the automated initial channel skeleton. So you can see that it's a two-dimensional raster. Um, it maps the channels from bank to bank and the width varies as the width of the channel varies. There's discontinuities included, um, but you'll see all of it is mapped in the same color. There's no distinction between what's what. In the bottom left, um, this is after the initial random forest classification um, using things like land cover composition and shape and different terrain characteristics. Um, the model has classified these different features into different classes, and that's represented by the different colors. And then in the bottom right, we've taken the stream features, the, those that were classified as streams, and we've connected them using um, a polyline network. So now there are no longer discontinuities in the network and it's a one dimensional network. We can add attributes to and um, select individual reaches and so on. Next slide, please. Um, Norm, yes, we are retaining all of the features. Um, all of those non-stream features will be retained. So, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some attributes. Um, like I said, we don't have a final list of attributes developed, but we have at least some that we are planning to include. So this is a really exciting one. Um, as a matter of course, in our process, we produce spatially explicit layers of channel width and bank height automatically. Um, it's just baked right into the workflow. So what I mean by spatially explicit is that um, as bank height or width varies along the channel, that's reflected in the data set. These are continuous rasters of these variables. So instead of having a single value for a whole reach, uh, we can actually see where along that reach are the banks higher or is the channel narrower. And that's useful for, um, for example, head cut identification I have on the screen here. So you can see this, um, this stream that's sort of shallow um, as it, it crosses the field and then it nears that wooded area and all of a sudden gets very in size and that's reflected in the bank height on the right 
Um, you can see it's nearly five meters deep right at that head cut. And then as the stream progresses down slope, the bank height lessens. So this sort of information would be lost in a reach scale summary. Like I said, if you just had one value for the whole reach, you wouldn't necessarily be able to, to see this sort of information. So um, we think that's really cool. And we plan to include this in the attributes. And even as a, a standalone data set, um, these bank height and width layers. Next slide, please. So another thing I wanted to mention is um, a field assessment that will be upcoming. So there's a nonprofit group called Friends of the Rappahannock, um, and they reached out to us um, with a, a contract that they have with um, NIFWF, National Fish and Wildlife Fund, I think. <laughs> And um, as part of their work with NIFWIF, um, they're going to be using our data set and they are going to be um, doing a little bit of field assessment. And this assessment will be conducted on a stratified random sample of our stream reaches. So what we mean by that is they will be visiting reaches in the proportion of stream orders that exist in a watershed. So if 60% of a watershed has first order streams, then 60% of the samples will be first order streams. Um, and the field data that they're going to measure will include channel width, bank height, and the presence or absence of flow. And these data will be compared against our desktop-based estimates or predictions. And the information gathered throughout this field assessment will form our approach bay-wide. So um, it's not to say that we're just going to make this like super awesome ground truth data in the Rappahannock and nowhere else. Uh, we're going to take this information and use it to inform our approach, and it will be reflected bay-wide. Next slide, please. So year four timeline, um, what's coming up in the near future. So we plan to have that initial automated channel mapping done um, in September, very soon. We're on the last leg of it. It's probably going to take a week, maybe two. And we plan to have random forest classification complete for the Bay watershed by the end of this calendar year in December. And from that random forest classification, we will take the features classified as streams and produce blue line maps, initial blue line maps um, by February or March, uh, you know, late winter, early spring of next year. And as I mentioned, there will be an iterative um, review and revision process following the initial production of those blue line maps, where we will be correcting problems as we see them um, adjusting our approach if we find systematic problems that we think we could fix automatically. Um, so that will be a sort of iterative uh, correction and reproduction of data process. Next slide, please. So, David, now we have a question for the audience. Um, I'm going to switch to that on Menti to let people uh, answer how they're, you know, if they're actively working on any project where they could use your data set and if so, which geographies. Um, however, okay. there are a bunch of questions in the chat as well. So I'm going to switch to that on Menti and then let you answer those. Okay. Yeah, I'll bring up the chat. Yep. David, uh, I can. Yeah. Um, okay. The first question was um, from Mark. And the question is um, Are you planning on um, categorizing ephemeral versus perennial versus intermittent streams as part of the channel attribution? Um, we hope to, uh, to put it short. So we have a plan for how we might approach that. Um, we've demonstrated a proof of concept of that in our initial development of this method in 2017, but it relies on data from the USGS program called StreamStats. And 
that data is not available everywhere that we need it, but we've been in contact with USGS um, and Peter Claggett of, of USGS has, um, he's sort of acting as our liaison with the stream stats group. And we're trying to get the information we need from stream stats so that we can um, implement those predictions. So it's, it's not a, I can't answer yes or no, um, but we hope to, and to put it short. Um, awesome. Um, our second question came from Eric Jesperson, which was, uh, have you calculated confidence curves for non-stream features as for the stream features? Yes. So every feature that gets classified by the model will have a probability associated with it um, for for that the feature that it was classified as and all the other features. So, um, so for example, if there was a gully, the model might say there's an eighty percent chance that it's a gully, you know, a five percent chance that it's a ditch, a two percent chance that it's a stream, a ten percent chance that it's something else, and so on. So every feature will have a probability that it could belong into any of the different classes. And the goal is to have a high probability in a single class. That way we can be confident that the classification is actually accurate. Awesome. Um, and then we had a question from Aaron Ledovic um, that if there are additional partners identified who would be interested in um, field truthing, um, who to contact, and I gave her your... Yes, um, tell me about that. I'd love to hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's my email. Um, you could email me and Matt Baker. Um, we are leading this hydrography effort in its entirety. Um, it's just us on it, so get in touch with us. I see, I have the chat open here, Katie. Um, okay. So I see a message from James Martin. Is the Rappahannock sufficiently representative of the whole watershed to justify using ground truthing there to inform the methods everywhere? So um, that's a good question. And I don't think that it's a matter of that watershed being representative of the rest of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, it's more, so these are objective measures that will be collected. Um, so we have a method to estimate bank height and channel width that operates independently of geography or physiography. Um, it's working with some outputs from the DEM and the line of sight analysis. So this, these algorithms we've developed work the same way everywhere um, because they work directly from characteristics of the elevation model itself. So when the Rappahannock group is measuring channel width, um, we're just gonna be directly comparing their field measured channel width to our desktop based um, estimated channel width. So I don't think that there will be an issue of um, you know, having a representative watershed. I hope that, I hope I was clear in that. Did that clear it up? Okay. Uh, Ellen, will you make the automated channel data available as an intermediate product? Um, so we, can provide it upon request, similar to Rachel mentioned. Um, we're trying to limit the distribution of preliminary data just for the reasons Rachel mentioned, because um, we're going to have more refined data available later. But depending on the need and the use case, yes, we can make it available. Um, and then obviously, once we have more finalized data, all of this will be available publicly. Frank, I see you mentioned the Kekapon Institute can help with ground truth in the Upper Potomac. That's awesome. Um, if you want to, like I said, just send me and, and Matt an email and we can get in touch about that. That's great.
Yes, automated channel extraction in urban systems is indeed very complex. So um, this is an area where our two-dimensional raster channel skeleton will map the channels that are visible from the LiDAR data. So if there's a surface channel that's in the LiDAR, we can map that. But as you know, in urban systems, those channels are often buried or piped underground or routed, who knows where. So uh, due to the limitations of the data we have, we're not able to determine where those channels go once they go underground. So um, when we produce that connected polyline network, those polylines will follow the surface channels where they exist in the LIDAR. But once they go underground, the polyline will follow the terrain surface to the next downslope surface channel. So that may or may not be where the channel is actually routed once it goes underground. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. So that's a limitation to be aware of. Um, but it's also a good example of why we are publishing both that discontinuous data, the raster data, as well as the polyline data, because different data are more applicable in different situations. Rachel, did we do the Menti thing? I don't. We did. did. We... I switched. Um, okay, maybe I was reading the chat. Did... I didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got a bunch of responses. Okay. So. Before I'll bring it up in my own browser later. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Oh, all right. All right. Well, Thank you so much, David. We're going to pass it on to the next objective. And if anyone else has more questions, you guys, um, oh wait, James, real quick, he asked the timeline uh, and when the data is made available. I do think that's a good question to answer now real quick. Yeah. So um, I'd say we hope to have initial data uh, available next year um, in year four. And as I mentioned, we'll continue to be refining and updating and fixing that data as it as we can um, with obviously the, the goal to have final products produced at the end of this, this agreement. And I think it's 2024, um, mm -hmm. but it's not, you're not gonna have to wait till 2024 to see any of this. Um, I think we're going to start putting data out next year. Um, I would say late, later next year, not January of next year. Um, we hope to start making these polylines in like February of next year, maybe March, early spring. Um, and then we'll want to do our own, you know, first pass of reviews of the data and correct some systematic fixes that need to be done. Um, so I would, I would guess late last year, late, sorry, late next year um, would be when we could start sharing some data. Awesome. Thanks, David. Um, anybody else who has questions, you can uh, message in the chat still. David will still be online or email him. All right, we're gonna move on to objective three with Lewis and Katie presenting. All right, thanks, Rachel. Um, hey everyone, this is Lewis Cadell, Geospatial Program Manager here at the Conservancy's Conservation Innovation Center. Um, I help manage Objective 3, BMP Planning and Reporting, along with my colleague Katie Walker, who helps to coordinate a lot of our outreach efforts around this uh, objective. And partnered with us in this effort um, is the Commons, you know, they produce the field doc, the MP tracking and reporting platform, and the Drex Drexel environmental data science team. So I know there are probably some people on the call um, who may not be familiar with Objective 3, so I'll just provide a quick recap here. Um, essentially, we're looking at scale and precision conservation in the Chesapeake Bay watershed in relation to BMP planning and reporting. Um, we're seeking to address two challenges. 
Um, one being that restoration investments are often made opportunistically and disparately. You know, partners are often looking for better ways to identify and prioritize opportunities for restoration um, to maximize impact for meeting with goals with the money that they have. A second challenge um, involves how not all restoration progress is being recorded through current reporting structures. And additionally, um, reported data is often given back to planners in aggregated summaries, which um, can be a little more challenging when helping at the parcel scale. And so this objective proposes to create a data-driven blueprint and spatial planning, tracking, and reporting system that will help the Chesapeake Bay Program Office and jurisdictions to better capture uh, more BMP activities within their geographies and to help identify activity gaps within priority watersheds to support ongoing initiatives. Next slide. Uh, so objective three um, is really focused on bringing the ACPF or Agricultural Conservation Planning Framework GIS toolbox, which is developed by the USDA Agricultural Research Service out in Midwest to the Chesapeake. Um, you know, this toolbox essentially utilizes different um, geospatial data sets uh, related to soil, water, and landscape. And it produces a suite of um, like conservation practice opportunity data at the parcel scale. And essentially what we have done is take this toolbox and combine it with the great data sets coming out of objectives one and two to scale um, this resource across the watershed. Next slide. So what will these practices look like? Um, essentially, these opportunity footprints will be GIS shape files um, that you can pull into a map and you, know, you can start to visually see where these opportunities are on the ground. Um, some examples here are, say, you know, riparian forest or grass uh, buffer opportunities as shown in pink here, grass waterways in green, um, et cetera. Next slide. So what are we looking to do with the results? Um, you know, there are a number of uses for this resource. Um, we think that the opportunity layers can help regional and local restoration planners and implementers um, with streamlining watershed planning, engaging a wider audience, you know, providing that understanding of where opportunities are for a suite of practices on the landscape. This can help, um, you know, on the ground efforts when it comes to planning more efficient field visits, uh, working with a landowner with the menu of options, you know, where every parcel is different, maybe that landowner doesn't want to put a buffer there or install, you know, a practice uh, on the other side of this property, you know, maybe looking at a different scenario. Um, so just giving that resource to help with that conversation and also to provide scientific validity for funding proposals. Next slide. Um, and then a second component of this objective is the further development of the field doc platform developed by the Commons. Um, Katie, my colleague, will talk a little more in depth about some of these components um, later in this presentation, but essentially with this objective, is looking to do is um, create more features within field doc to help with planning, tracking and reporting of BMPs. Um, this will include a planning module where you can integrate the different BMP opportunity footprints that are being produced. Um, in addition to using different layering options to help identify you know, more potential projects on the back end. The Drexel team will be assisting with um, some pretty cutting edge uh, precision modeling that will be incorporated 
And this will be done through a rapid watershed delineation API, um, a fast normal statistics API, and then we'll also be piloting a relative confidence index. And then finally, um, streamline tracking and reporting workflows uh, will be enhanced you know, as we go through this process. And field doc is um, being integrated with other state reporting systems. Um, and we hope that this platform can help you know, fill some of the gaps in the watershed um, where there may not be that smooth connection between planning and reporting. Next slide. So to summarize the BMP opportunity mapping for year three, um, we conducted some initial testing, looking at the new, you know, intermediate hyper-resolution hydrography data set in region one of the lower Susquehanna, um, and compared that to some of the other hydrography data sets uh, currently publicly available. We've been working on producing an initial watershed-wide uh, forest buffer and grass buffer opportunity layer. And then we have also been working on preparing the ACPF toolbox for additional regions. Next slide. Uh, this is just one example here where you know we took a look at the different hydrography data sets available in the lower Susquehanna. Um, in purple, you can see the National Hydrography data set which you know is the industry standard currently. Um, generally, it'll follow stream channels, although it won't quite uh, follow the meanders of certain channels as closely as we would like for parcel scale analyses. Uh, the Conservancy has an in-house enhanced flow path data set shown in blue here, which is based on a 60 acre flow accumulation threshold combined with the land cover water class. There's also a great um, facet streamlined data set, uh, which is available through the Bay program in green. And that um, is a little more similar to NHD, but um, it's produced with higher resolution data and so follows some of the meanders of the stream channel a little bit better. And then it's, it's a little hard to see here because it's under the other layers, but the hyper resolution hydrography uh, layer in orange. And so we've been looking at these different layers, um, comparing, you know, how we might be able to produce an intermediate data set while we're waiting for the hyper-res hydrography. Um, you know, while we map these buffers, opportunities watershed-wide, um, this will be just a draft initial data set. Um, so different stakeholders can kind of start to play with the data uh, while we anticipate um, updated versions as the new hydrography becomes available from objective two. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we realized that within the watershed, there are ongoing initiatives to map BMP opportunities. Um, there are existing BMP tracking and reporting systems. You know, this objective seeks to um, kind of fill the gaps within the watershed where those resources may not be available and to supplement existing workflows and initiatives. And so this first version um, of a watershed-wide buffer opportunity data set is something that we hope to get out there to start some of these conversations. Um, currently, we're using the older 2013 slash 2014 land cover um, and older hydrography data sets to produce this first version. Um, we have the currently the Susquehanna watershed and the James watershed uh, to the north and south there. And then we're currently filling in the gaps um, for Maryland, West Virginia, and uh, Northern Virginia. And as David mentioned, you know, there are some lighter DEM gaps in Virginia. Um, but it sounds like those are getting filled soon, which is good news. Next slide. Uh, so year four, um, 
you know, we continue to look at stakeholder outreach for the ACPF mapping. Um, we're looking at expanding on the initial pilot we conducted in Lower Susquehanna and making improvements to that workflow. And then our other big effort um, will be starting up a pilot for stormwater BMP mapping. Um, we are looking at developing a protocol um, for a select number of practices. Um, we're still in the very early stages of this. Um, and we're looking at outreach and research and development in year four. Next slide. So expanding ACPF, um, as mentioned, you know, we have initial outputs for region one in the map on the right here for the lower Susquehanna. Um, in year four, we'll be expanding to regions two through six. Um, in terms of timeline for like the final BMP opportunity data sets, um, the final release will be more towards the end of the cooperative agreement. Um, currently, we're just heavily involved in streamlining the workflow and scripting process, um, making refinements based on feedback from the Bay Program and advisory groups. Um, we're also, you know, continuing to conduct the testing that will come with the release of newer high resolution land use land cover and the hydrography data sets. Um, and so this will be an iterative process where we produce initial outputs, gather feedback, incorporate new data sets as they become available, and rerun uh, regions as we learn, you know, uh, new lessons learned. Um, and make adjustments based on feedback. And yep, uh, we will be continuing to um, reach out to different states and regional and local groups as we have this data ready to share. And hopefully that will happen in the uh, later portion of year four. Next slide. Um, as mentioned, you know, we will be looking into a stormwater mapping protocol pilot. Um, we are currently looking at Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, and we have also received some stormwater infrastructure GIS data from a number of jurisdictions. And so we're kind of exploring potential options of testing some of the um, like mapping exercises potentially in Maryland and Virginia as well. Next slide. And then just out of curiosity, um, we're curious whether there are any stormwater practices that you would like to see a BMP opportunity map for. This is just uh, still on the board link um, and they should pop up on the screen if anybody has anything. There are some comments in the chat. Um, um, can you repeat the meaning of the ACPF acronym? Oh yeah, that's the Agricultural Conservation Planning Framework. Um, it's publicly available online from the USDA. And again, this question will remain up so people can think, take some time to think about it and respond. Um, I would also just like to um, respond to Frank's question about what API stood for. Um, and I did put it in the chat, but API is an application programming interface. Um, and it's essentially, um, software that connects two applications. Um, and as I mentioned in this case, uh, one application is the field doc platform and then Drexel hosts some modeling work. And so what an API does is it just creates a connection between these two programs so that we can utilize 
um, all of the computing work that Drexel is hosting uh, within the field doc application and not duplicating the work, instead just creating a connection between two separate hosted platforms. Thanks, Caitlin. There's also a comment by James Martin there, um, just making sure Lewis and Katie saw that as well. All right, I guess we'll continue the uh, presentation and uh, you guys again can continue to fill out this question. All right, we'll pass it to Katie. Awesome. Thanks, Lewis. Um, and so as Lewis mentioned, um, we are doing a ton of work with our partners at the Commons and Drexel's environmental data science team. Um, and so just um, summarizing what we've been working on in the past year, um, in field doc with the commons, um, we've put out a couple new updates. Um, so one of the updates that was incorporated into the field doc platform is a new module called Atlas, um, which is used for program managers, um, some backend development to leverage Drexel's analytical APIs, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, especially looking at forest buffer best management practices, um, and then some other new features and integrations, um, which I, I'll go into detail um, shortly. And then with Drexel, we worked on some backend precision modeling um, and then the development of um, the APIs used um, to connect all of their really great modeling work um, into the field doc platform, um, including a pilot for um, a relative confidence index. Next slide, please. Um, so just a quick um, summary of, of why we um, have been investing in field doc and these backend um, modeling components. Um, and in terms of planning and tracking BMP implementation, um, when we started this project, um, the feedback that was given to the Bay program was that there's you know, several programs that are funding and tracking implementation efforts. Um, however, each of these programs have their own reporting protocols, their own metrics and standards and requirements for what they're tracking um, and how they're tracking information about implementation. Um, there's varying functionality or requirements for each of these reporting systems. Um, and because it's um, not centralized until the final reporting, um, there's no way to connect this information uh, back to planning efforts to create um, really actionable um, items to move forward with restoration. Um, there's also been an issue in the past, just a lack of spatial resolution for um, tracking BMP data. And often um, people who are planning uh, BMP implementation are getting very static and stale data um, whether they're passed through spreadsheets, um, transposing um, field information into a digital platform um, and waiting for that to come um, through the cyclical process. Um, and just in general, not all projects are being documented um, through a specific reporting protocol. Um, and so we've been trying to uh, work with the Bay program to um, identify features um, that when put into a platform would help alleviate some of these challenges. So uh, we've partnered with the Commons um, who have the field doc platform. Um, they've been working to develop it for a few years now. Um, and through um, this cooperative agreement, we are working on additional features and functionality um, as I said, to kind of address some of those challenges. Um, in general, the field doc platform is a metric-based restoration tracking um, for landowners and investors of um, management practices. It has standardized metrics and reporting processes um, for project implementation reports um, across different funding programs 
Um, so while aspects of the metrics that are used are standardized, um, what gets written in is then available for any funding program um, to utilize. Field doc enables users to manage all facets um, from planning, reporting, and tracking BMP implementation. Um, and it supports these users um, with various levels um, and uh, wording and, and language that really matches the workflow um, that people are familiar with. Um, and anticipated users of the field doc platform um, are grant administrators or managers, um, such as NIFWIF, Maryland's DNR, uh, Virginia Environmental Endowment, and other grant programs. Uh, regional watershed implementation planners, um, folks working on WIP development um, or more local, um, more local planning, um, such as county action plans or um, 319 programs. Um, and then the grant recipients, so the restoration service providers who receive money to implement projects. Um, so in the past year, um, what we've done in the field doc platform, um, we've instituted a multi-program reporting, which allows uh, one project to be associated with multiple programs. Um, and what this does is recognizes that um, for the most part, when restoration work is done, it's being funded through multiple avenues. Um, and previously, um, separate reports would have had to be written and compiled for each of those individual grant programs. Um, and by adding the functionality for a multi-program reporting um, to assign a project um, to multiple grant programs um, and, and all of the metrics um, that each of those programs requires would just be um, a part of the tracking process uh, makes it a lot easier for that end of year reporting or end of project reporting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've worked on developing what's called the Atlas module. And the Atlas module is a visual summary um, of information that supports BMP tracking and planning. Uh, incorporated into this module is what was previously known as um, Field Docs dashboard functionality. Um, and so basically it's, it's really just kind of looking at all of these metrics and finding visual ways to um, display and incorporate these um, for more uh, informed de decision-making. Um, the application integration, um, as I mentioned, we are accessing um, some really awesome computing coming from Drexel, um, which we'll go into in just a little bit. Um, but a lot of this is supporting precision nutrient reduction modeling, um, so making improvements to um, what was previously available through field doc, um, and then as well as integrating uh, water quality data from um, the Commons other platform water reporter, and just um, trying to um, see how many um, how many different applications. Um, it would be worth connecting and finding those backend connections so that within one platform, you are accessing uh, modeling and data available through some of these other platforms um, and just leveraging this data for uh, a more informed planning and reporting process. Um, and then the last part, of course, is just some additional um, small features um, to support um, an updated nutrient reduction modeling, um, as well as um, some minor um, kind of just usability, uh, user interface features, updates, um, all of which can be found um, via Field Docs uh, update website. Um, so we've kind of talked a lot about uh, our nutrient reaction modeling pilot. Um, and what we are working on is a way to better estimate potential load reductions for BMP implementation at a site level. Um, so thinking about individual practice implementation um, and having a good way to understand what the potential load reductions are at that site scale. Um, and the vision for you know, why we wanna do this is to really encourage BMP planning 
um, that identifies projects that are likely to meet or exceed um, the credited regional nutrient reductions, um, understanding that the watershed model goes above and beyond and um, has a ton of information um, that is not easily replicable um, for regional nutrient reductions. Um, the action that we're taking is integrating some site level spatial modeling um, in combination with the existing Chesapeake Bay modeling um, outputs and algorithms so that we can improve and have a better understanding of um, site level reductions and how they, um, how they compare to these regional nutrient reductions. Um, and our goal um, for right now in terms of the pilot is to um, have this modeling available and accessible by program managers um, to look at the projects that are uh, either proposed or um, have been implemented in um, their portfolio for the last year um, and just see if this information um, is actionable and is providing insights um, that can help improve the planning process. So in the upcoming year, um, for what we are um, planning on working on and moving forward with um, our planning support is, um, of course, the relative confidence index, um, both in combination with um, Drexel's incredible modeling team and the Commons um, development of the field doc platform. Um, we're hoping to put in field doc um, some additional documentation and tutorials um, for what the relative confidence index is and how it can be utilized um, and piloting that with program administrators um, for some of the grant programs that are actively using field doc for reporting. And then there are additional improvements um, to the field docs prioritization capabilities um, to support a planning module, uh, which will be a separate sandboxing environment, um, further segmenting um, field doc, which is, uh, has previously been uh, mostly focused and used for the reporting part um, of the restoration tracking um, and really creating this sandbox environment that will um, separate out planning from reporting um, and incorporate these elements of the relative confidence index um, and other um, things like the integration of the BMP opportunity layers, which Lewis mentioned earlier. Um, and by incorporating all of these features, um, our goal is to create this um, really usable tool for uh, both on the ground, um, you know, technical service providers, as well as the grant program um, administrators, um, and having that support for both levels of planning. And so we are going to switch back to Menti. Um, to ask a quick question on. Um... Actually, I'm not sure if this one made it into Menti. It looks. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, you guys can post this in the chat, actually. Yeah, absolutely. I guess that would work still. So, just curious if anyone's acti uh, actively working on any projects where this data that was just discussed would be helpful, and if so, which geographies. Um, we're actually running short on time, so if people want to answer this, you can type it in the chat. I'm sorry that Menti didn't get that one. Um, uh, and otherwise, any questions for Katie and Lewis can also be typed in the chat just to save time so that the final presentation can uh, finish. So thank you so much, Katie and Lewis. And we'll pass it over quickly to Jake. And sorry about the short time frame here, Jake. It's okay, we'll keep it tight, uh, recognizing that objective four, for those who are not familiar, is general geospatial support for the Chesapeake Bay program and finding how um, basically the way the Bay program works internally can be used to support objectives one through three. Uh, so really providing geospatial planning and support to CDP to allow partners to integrate geospatial data into management efforts. Uh, so next slide. 
So what that looked like over the course of year three was having a better understanding internally within the Bay program about how GIS tools and data support tools, basically um, the data itself and the tools are utilized throughout. Uh, this involved contracting out to a research partner, RTI Innovation Advisors, to sort of complete a nine month long research process. Uh, the first three months were selecting and uh, contracting them. So really this fit into four separate categories, which included planning for this user research, um, some specific interviews with key stakeholders, some of who are on the call today, uh, a broader surveying effort, uh, which really reached out to a variety of folks recognizing that a key 20 people is not going to be representative of the Greater Bay Program ecosystem. And then how are we integrating those results of that greater re user research into supporting objectives one through three and the Bay Program in general. So next slide. Uh, so yes, background, really looking at uh, Git orientation, uh, the goal implementation teams within the Bay program, understanding the need for specific cross Git or code benefits and ways that potential products and decision support systems could be more beneficial where the barriers, gaps, and lack of understanding when it comes to GIS tools and terminology. Um, so next slide. Uh, so really, this took the form initially of a key stakeholders interviews. We interviewed about 20 folks, really looking at a variety of discussion topics, but recognizing that these one to two hour long interviews could take their own paths, uh, really having an understanding of mapping products that are critical for achieving good outcomes and the way they're being used uh, to tie it all back, really have a better understanding of how and who is using GIS products in the Bay program can help us tailor the results that are going to be published for objectives one, two, and three in the next year, uh, how they're being used, what aspects, what specific things, what are most critical, and how are they not being used? What are the barriers? What are the um, sort of pain points or problems um, when it comes to that. And then finally recognizing how can we make these cross goal team or cross Bay program benefits, not just supporting one goal implementation team or one goal of the Bay program, but across the greater Bay program ecosystem. Uh, next slide. So what that really looked like is we ended up uh, understanding that about half of our interviewees were infrequent users of GIS. This means they are somewhat familiar with the tools and the data that come out, but don't really use them that often. Uh, about 30% are frequent users, probably consults existing tools within their day to day, and they are comfortable with understanding what um, capacity GIS is used in. And then the expert users, about 20%, those would be folks like GIS analysts, data producers, uh, folks like our team here who is producing and designing GIS and GIS decision support tools. Uh, so next slide. So really what we did from there was we took all of the sort of insights that we gathered from the stakeholder interviews, recognizing that those 20 key interviewees were great and informative, but we needed to have a better representation across the Bay program ecosystem. So we identified a couple hundred uh, Bay program team members through the goal implementation teams and various work groups to help prioritize uh, some further actions to support objectives one through three in the Bay program. Uh, so we really utilize the findings to design a greater survey, uh, so to speak. So next slide. Uh, this really shook down to uh, looking at familiarity with mapping tools and sort of what is most important when using them and using GIS in the Bay program. Uh, would you need more guidance on what the tools there are or how to use them or where they are available? And then specifically about the data, is there more interest in higher resolution versus more timely versus um, new kinds of data, for example, more climate related information or demographic related information? Um, and then looking at that from sort of the goal implementation team perspective, uh, how readily available those types of data are. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then really going a little bit further to provide some potential solutions. This is where uh, we really found some benefit uh, providing some options about ways we can better utilize GIS in the Bay program and beyond, understanding that there are some specific needs and pain points that the data we're producing or any sort of GIS data in the Bay program could solve and how do we sort of fix that. Uh, some of the suggestions that came up were central location for tools, case studies on the use of tools, some more training, uh, new types of data, and we sort of left it open as well to provide other solutions. Uh, next slide. 
So out of the 215 surveys that were sent out, we got 114, which is a 53% response rate. So that is a very big deal because we were expecting half of that. Um, so we have a pretty intensive pool of data to pull from. And the major sort of results that came out of that were there is an extreme amount of interest in a central location for tools, uh, understanding that people need to know where tools are available, what they're doing, how to access them across the Bay program. And then there is an extreme level of interest in new types of data, specifically environmental justice and equity data and climate change data. Uh, both of those, of course, become more and more prevalent in the last few years and more data and interest around those has been represented. Uh, next slide. So really this sort of breaks down a little bit further about how many respondents ranked their potential solutions. As I said, a lot of interest in providing new types of data and a central location for these tools or these data sets uh, for the Bay program. Um, and you can sort of break it down from there about what is of interest. And then when we talk about potential types of data, uh, you can go back to the next slide. Uh, really, environmental justice and equity and climate change data were highly represented. There is a key stated need for more of that information, while hydrology and geology are considered data rich. Um, and an important point here, considered data rich, meaning this is sort of what folks comprehend and perceive as availability, which might not be the reality of the situation. This is not just a question of GIS, but it's a question of communication and how our end users are gonna be utilizing these tools, even if they don't know they exist or utilize them differently. Uh, so next slide. All uh, right, so sort of we took a wide variety of those results and have come up with a couple of proposed tasks for how that could look uh, influencing going into year four in coordination with the release of the data from objectives one, two, and three. Uh, basically, we need a little bit more time to keep going through that information that we received. It's a huge dearth of just widely available data that is representative of a huge amount of players in the conservation restoration sphere. And we want to give it the time it deserves to sort of evaluate that. So we're going to be taking some more time in the next year to further understand the results of this user research initiative. In addition to sort of represent the need for a central location for tools um, and a central location for data and how we will be publishing objectives one through three's data, we are looking into utilizing ArcGIS Hub as a open data platform to better serve and sort of centralize uh, Bay program related conservation and restoration data. So we're seeing how Hub can be worked for us uh, in a way that sort of is on trend with a variety of other data providers at the Bay scale. A lot of states are providing information through our GIS Hub now, and we are in conversations with Esri to figure out the best way to do that for our team and hopefully utilizing the land cover, land use, and hydrography data as a prime example of the sort of data that can be easily accessible uh, as compared to just having it on our website as a simple data download. Help provides some more analytical options, some um, ability to dig into the data a little bit further without the level of expertise needed. Uh, and part of this too, we'll be looking into how to better define those co-benefits when we have a product like ArcGIS Hub or some data results like we got through RTI in this past year. So we're looking into a more academic style, formal research into these sort of co-benefits or cross git benefits and how we can better sort of analyze that because the process in the past for supporting those sort of cross team benefits and supporting the Bay program has been pretty on the fly. So looking at a little more formalized process and part of that would be support further support internally for the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership as an existing example of a cross-benefit goal map. And the data that is coming out of the Conservation Partnership specifically um, is pulling from our high resolution land cover data and how can we better utilize the two, uh, looking at it as a baywide analysis. Um, so that is gonna be an opportunity in year four to sort of explore that further. Um, and Rachel, I know we have a mentee question next, but if we're five minutes over, we could just skip it and wrap. Uh, I'll leave it up to you. Um, I'll just put it up on the screen for anybody that um, wants to okay. <laughs> answer it, but I know it's also past time. Um, so, yeah. So it is up and people can fill that in. In the meantime, um, I'll just put up our, all of our uh, email addresses. And thank you, Jake, and everybody else. I'm sorry that we ran a little bit over and that Jake had to rush through. I will share out the PowerPoint with the mentee results summarized. Um, I'll pull in the objective three question as well and some answers that we got in the chat. I'm sorry that we missed that question. Uh, there's also a resource here with the link to our website that we have a 
page specifically about the Bay Program Agreements um, or objectives. So thank you, everybody. Um, looks like we are getting a few answers mm -hmm. here, so that's awesome. So I will, I'm going to uh, pause the recording now or see if there's any more. People are also typing in the chat. Perfect. All right. Let me stop recording.